Uh, good morning in Australia, good afternoon in Mexico City, good evening wherever else you are in the world. Welcome to Crillionaire Crypto Chat, where we tell you all the best projects and all the most wonderful things that you can invest in, sponsored by Boston Coin. I'm sitting with uh, David Kepsel. David is incredibly qualified, uh, much more qualified than you'll find from most people who are actually running cryptocurrencies. He's an entrepreneur, an author, a philosopher, an attorney. He's an educator, and his research focuses on where science, technology, and ethics, and public policy all intersect together. David has provided commentary regarding ethics, society, religion, and technology on MSNBC, Fox News Channel, The Guardian, The Washington Times, NPR Radio, Radio Free Europe, Air America, The Atlanta Journal, Constitution, Associated Press, and now he's on Crillionaire Crypto Chat. So things are really moving up for him now. David has tenured Associate Professor of Philosophy at the Delphi University of Technology. He has um, been the Professor of Management in the Netherlands, Visiting Professor at UNAM in Mexico, Director of Research and Strategic Initiatives, also in Mexico. He's the co-founder and CEO of EncryptGen. That's Encrypt with a G, not encryption, EncryptGen. It's the world's first blockchain-mediated genetic data exchange. So it's got blockchain, it's got DNA, it's super complicated, and we're going to try and put into the layman's term so that I can understand it. It's very complicated. So, David, welcome to the show. Thank you for, for being with us. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Can you please tell us how someone who majored in philosophy and law actually got into DNA and genetics? Sure. Well, <clears throat> I married a, a scientist uh, in genomics. Uh, my, my wife is a pharmacogenomics um, PhD. Um, and uh, she, uh, when, I, when we met at first, I, I didn't know much about the science of genomics, uh, but I wanted to be able to engage in conversations with her about it. And I'd written about computers and philosophy uh, for years, uh, and I was interested in genomics as a sort of another sort of code. Uh, so I, I studied up on it. I read a lot of books on it. And, and she's, of course, a great teacher, too, and um, has um, moved me in the direction of understanding how uh, genomics and our identities and our, and our ability to control the data um, interact. And, and because of my interest in ethics, I, um, I decided, OK, maybe I can get something, some, some more uh, books out of this. And, and I wrote a book, and I, I got a visiting um, appointment at the Yale Interdisciplinary um, Bioethics Center um, and wrote a book while there uh, called Who Owns You? And that book came out in 2009. It was about a common practice at the time, which was patenting genes. Um, and then uh, 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 there were actually just a couple months after my book came out, there was a big lawsuit. Um, actually, a, fellow, a friend of mine, Luigi uh, Palombi, and is an Australian uh, lawyer. He and I hooked up over this issue and started doing lectures and, and giving talks and writing articles and, and doing amicus briefs about it. And actually in 2013, the US Supreme Court stopped the practice of gene patenting um, using many of the same arguments we, we had made in our, our work. Um, and then you know, there was this big gap in the law really about how it is we can control that data because you can't patent it and you also can't own that data. So, because of my interest in ethics, because of my interest, my new interest in genetics, we thought, well, maybe we can actually create something to solve this problem. And we co-founded uh, EncryptGen in 2017 uh, uh, to, to uh, be able to provide a, a way for people to be able to benefit from their genomic data and to get more of that data out, out there for science. Mm -hmm. I, so I guess a, a lot of people- is entirely to, <laughs> the source of all of this, really. So. Well, many of us have done crazier things for our loved ones, right? So, <laughs> you know, get, getting getting a new education and writing a book is probably the least the least crazy thing we've, we've done for love. Uh, I'm thinking you're a very early adopter. Like 2009, most people wouldn't have been aware of what's going on. I mean, it's, it's, it seems to be only in the last couple of years where people have come to realise how much of their data is owned by Facebook, how much of their data is owned by Google and these sort of things. So how, how did you become aware of this, I guess, this data mining of our genes like way back then? 
So, so at the time, you know, these big genetic testing companies were still very nascent and um, it was a, it was still a very growing business without many customers. It was a niche market. Um, and it was this gap really, you know, the, when you cannot patent data, there's no other way to own it. Um, and there's no other way really to control it. Data, you know, the, the, a famous, um, um, a famous uh, person once said about data, data wants to be free. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, you know, a description really. It's not, it, it's not nothing mysterious. Data just happens to flow easily from place to place. And there are very few ways to limit its movement. Um, copyright and patents are, are sort of a way to, to control it. Um, but when those are gone and genomic data was no longer able to be patented, um, there's really no way to limit the, the flow of that, that information. And there's no way really built into the testing companies and genetic, genetic testing marketplace uh, that exists now uh, to compensate people for, for that data. And I knew it was very valuable. So I, I, you know, I, I used to teach in bioethics, I used to teach about Henrietta Lacks. Mm -hmm. um, her HeLa cells, these famous cells made hundreds of millions of dollars around the world and she died in poverty. Um, and that, you know, was always a sort of a, a stark example of the injustice that can happen when people's data, people's tissues mm -hmm. uh, are not properly compensated. Uh, and we knew that we needed to get on the ground floor of this and make sure there was a, a mechanism to reward people uh, for what they're contributing to science. Um, and that, that's, you know, that was all our impetus. Yeah, I think anybody who hasn't, who's not aware of the Henrietta Lacks story um, should go and Google that or, or read the Wikipedia page or watch the documentary because it is quite fascinating how this yeah. woman, you know, just because of the mutation of one of her cells. And I think at last count, there's 50 million tons of her cells alive in the world today that are being tested on, experimented on, they've shot her into space and all sorts of things. And as you say, she didn't get a dime from any of this right. stuff. So Only recently though, I mean, the, NA, the NIH only recently decided to reward her family and undisclose some. Oh, okay. um, but that was many years after she was uh, dead, and mm -hmm. it wasn't based on any legal requirement. There's no law that says that people have to be compensated for that. Yeah. So at, at the moment, like if I can compare it to the data farming that goes on with, say, with Google and Facebook and these sort of things, because I know Facebook tracks me when I go to other websites, even if I'm not using Facebook. There's mm -hmm. something on my computer or my phone. They can see what I buy. They can see where I shop. They can see where I walk around. And they're selling this data to other companies and making millions of dollars from advertising and that sort of stuff. So yes. what's the actual market size for, I guess, marketing my DNA or for companies to make profit from my DNA? How, how much does that work? That's a very good question. And we don't have a lot of insight in that uh, because a lot of that data is kept private. Um, the companies 23andMe and um, uh, Ancestry.com are private companies. We really don't know the scope of all of their deals. Um, but we can estimate. Um, and right now, uh, the best guess is that people who are being tested, who've, who've done these genetic tests, their data is being sold up to 200 times um, for something like a total of $200 uh, so far. Uh, but they can keep selling that. You know, this is a, it's not like it's sold once and it's gone. They mm. can just keep selling and selling. They, they sell these aggregated data sets all the time. So um, your data is very valuable. And, and so I paid $140 to have the DNA test. So I could tell if I had Viking DNA or Chinese DNA or, or whatever. So I paid the company $140, trusted them with my data. And now you're saying they've sold it for like four or $5,000 to other people. They we should be paying exactly me for the, the test. They, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this, this is the sort of big, not so secret, uh, um, hidden secret about uh, the genetic testing market. It's actually not, they're not selling you genetic tests. They're selling um, buyers genetic data and it's your data. So this, the tests themselves are, are generally a loss leader. Um, the, you know, 99 bucks is what you can get tested for here in the States if you buy a 23andMe test. Yep. Uh, and, you know, it, it costs more than that to do the test because, you know, this is a um, a logistically uh, complicated thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, specialized um, knowledge involved. So 
it's a loss leader because they know they're going to, on the other end, they're going to make a lot of money selling the data. I mean, a couple of years ago, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, um, invested $300 million into uh, 23andMe for some exclusive access to data. Um, and 23andMe is going to do a SPAC, and they're, uh, um, they're estimating that the value of that SPAC, the valuation for that SPAC is going to be in the area of $4 billion uh, for the company. And that's a company that hasn't turned a profit yet. A special um, purpose acquisition company, a SPAC, is just like a, a huge big cash machine with nothing to do. It's a way to kind of go public without having to do the, the same processes of going public, yeah. And, and that's, a, I mean, that's $4 billion valuation for a company that hasn't turned a profit yet. Well, they, I mean, Wall Street knows what the value is and the value yeah. is that all of that data. The same is true for Ancestry. Ancestry recently was purchased by um, um, Blackstone. Uh, is, it, is it Blackstone? Blackstone, BlackRock, one of those. BlackRock, sorry, sorry BlackRock. Um, and, and BlackRock bought it for, for 4.7 billion ancestry and ancestry has 20 billion uh, 20 million customers who, who so that's if you do the math and try to mm. you know see how much 20 million you know um fits into 4.7 billion you see the value of that data is, is significant yeah so Although, that's at least a few thousand dollars anyway I, we, over the lifetime of that data yeah but the lifetime of that data is in perpetuity so mm. you know that's that's where that value comes in over time and and we think very modestly that, you know, people who are doing these tests should get some share of that, yeah. uh, of that revenue. And most people do the DNA tests just for fun, like just for an inquiry to see, you know, do I have like Spanish people in my ancestry? Why is my, my sister's skin darker than mine or, you know, whatever. So are you suggesting that maybe people stop getting DNA tested or they just do it and get paid for it? <laughs> We're saying do it and get pay, paid for it. So, you know, as I said, our co-founder is a scientist and the value for that data in science is tremendous. Mm. Uh, we expect within the next decade that your genetic data is going to be a regular part of your medical care. Um, and a lot of people are expecting that too. So that's part of the valuation of this data over time as well. Um, but, you know, in order to do that, in order for that data to be used in that way, we have to do a lot more science right now. Um, so we, we want people to get tested. We want their de-identified data to be used in science. We want those prices to be free market prices and not monopolistic. Uh, and we want people to get some share of the revenue from that data, as well as downstream, the, the medical value uh, of using that data for their care. So say in, in my example, I took a DNA test like a couple of years ago and a few members of my family did. And you know, my mum in particular has tracked down cousins and, and you know, different members of the family who they haven't seen, weren't even aware of because you know, one or two generations sort of split off. Um, so that was kind of a bit of fun and it was a social activity. Um, but say in my case, like my DNA has been sent to, I think, uh, 23 and me. Um, so how am I able to make a profit on that if I've already given it away? Right. So there's two things you can do. And this is, I've used 23 and me, our whole family did, uh, as well. When you, um, sign up for it and when you fill in the data online, you don't have to opt in to have that data used for science. Right. Uh, 80% of people do. And what that, wording suggests is it's just going to, you know, altruistic yeah. for science. But it, I mean, they're selling most of it. So um, you don't have to agree to that. Um, you can just take the data. Uh, you can download the, the raw data file from, from their site. Uh, they give you that option. It's hard to find. And we have a video on our YouTube channel that shows you how to do it. Um, and then you can upload it to our platform and when we start to have the kind of volume we need uh, for scientists, um, you'll be able to sell that data and get the rewards, 90% of which will come to you. Okay, so I've, I've kind of accidentally opted in. Can I now opt out or not? Yeah, you can opt out at any okay. time. All of these companies allow you at any time. They have to, um, you know, because of GDPR in Europe, uh, because of the privacy laws in New York and California, they have to allow you to opt out. Um, so. You can opt out at any time. You can still take that data and download it. Fantastic. So I can reclaim my data back 
give it to you, entrust it into your hands because you know a lot more about this stuff than I do. And basically, you just send me a check every few months. Is that how it works? You get paid in our cryptocurrency DNA. Um, okay. So when you create an account on myencryption.com, if you go into encryption.com and, and create an account, on, uh, you log in and register. Your email, you can choose any email you want. Um, and we recommend, you know, if you want to keep your data really private, create a special email uh, just for your genomic data. Mm -hmm. As soon as you create that account, you get a wallet. Uh, and our uh, blockchain has a native cryptocurrency called DNA. Uh, and every time you do a transaction, you sell that data, you'll get paid in DNA. Um, that DNA can be taken to um, various uh, exchanges. It can be sold on Uniswap for other currencies. Uh, or can, you can buy and sell it on Coin Metro, uh, which is a... Um, an Estonian-based um, uh, exchange, centralized exchange, that's available pretty much everywhere in the world, including the United States, which is really critical for us to be able to do business. Um, so that's how you get paid and that's how you cash out and, and, and make money. Okay, so you, you're sending me essentially a check, but it's it's DNA coin, mm -hmm. um, which I'm imagining you're, you're sending out a lot of DNA coin. Like, Who's, who's actually buying the coin? Who's, who's coming in from the other side? Is it the, the Ancestry 23andMe or is it GlaxoSmithKline? Who's buying this? So the tokenomics is, is this. We, we believe that people will treat um, DNA as the currency for genomics around the world over time. Mm -hmm. So people who are selling data are um, in, incentivized to hold on to that data um, to keep it in their wallet, um, partly because they expect that sometime the value of the coin will go up, um, but also um, because uh, we do uh, have a, a reward monthly. We, we provide 6% um, annual uh, reward for holding on to the coin. It, um, the companies and researchers who want to um, purchase data have to go to the public marketplaces to buy uh, DNA. Mm -hmm. They don't buy it from us. They go to Uniswap or they go to Coin Metro. They purchase DNA tokens there um, at, at whatever the market price is. Uh, we don't care. Uh, the price of your uh, genomic data is listed in U.S. dollars, and whatever the exchange rate is at the time um, for DNA tokens is what they have to spend in order to buy your data. So our and there's a limited number of the tokens out there. And so it should be a deflationary market. As the volume of data starts to move, um, we, we, we think people will value um, that marketplace and its currency more over time. I mean, obviously, so it's, there's, sorry? It's, a, it's, it's meant to be a true utility token. Mm -hmm. It creates a currency for a, for a unique niche marketplace. And we think that marketplace will expand to cover other sorts of medical uh, services too. So we've partnered with companies that do um, medical blockchains and, and want to incorporate genomics into that over time. Um, and that's, so w we think that's that's a dynamic that's gonna drive uh, that marketplace. Okay, so if, if someone wants to take a little piece of my DNA, like the, the hologram and experiment on it, do their magical science stuff, then they pay you for that data, you pay me, which is great. I'm just wondering, because obviously there's, there's thousands and thousands of different cryptocurrencies out there and some are deflationary like Bitcoin, some are inflationary like Doge or, or Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Why did you go to all the trouble of making your own coin? Yep, that's an excellent question. Again, we wanted to create an economy of genomics. So we know there's a sort of dark economy of genomics out there. It's all sort of closed off and nobody gets to participate in it right now. And we wanted to create an open one one that's transparent, where you can see the transactions, uh, where you get to participate as a seller directly. Uh, and actually you sell directly to the, the buyer and we just take a commission off the transaction. That's our revenue um, for the company. Um, and we only take 10% of the transaction cost. Uh, so we did also create the, com the, the uh, currency DNA, which you know is a pretty nice branding. Yeah. <laughs> Because uh, you know we're we're the ones who own that, um, uh, and it's a I think a pretty big indicator, you know, of of our commitment uh, to creating that economy. So you know I I go to trade shows and I give away these little I don't know if you can see it DNA oh, tokens. Nice. 
you know, the little swag things. And people like that. People like the idea of, of earning DNA for their DNA and mm. taking part in this, this, you know, wonderful scientific economy we're building. So the answer is you did it because it was cute. <laughs> Partly, yeah. I mean, it's a great brand. I, I love having the brand DNA. That's a, that's a, a kind of a, you know, a unique thing to have in this market space. Yeah, I, I know we're very early days at the moment, but how, how many DNA coins are there? Um, so there's there's 70 million uh, DNA tokens in the world, uh, and there will never be any more. It's um, an ERC20 token off of the you know Ethereum blockchain, yeah. um, and and uh, we have. Um, uh, <laughs> Yep, <laughs> so the dogs, now that's gonna set my dog off too. Uh, anyway, um, so we have, um, uh, we have uh, um, uh, about, no, I'm sorry, that's my dog. Sorry. We have about um, uh, 10 million of those tokens to run our economy. Um, and um, we just, uh, you know, the rest of them are out there in the wild, uh, you know, out there for purchase or buying, uh, for conducting the uh, business of our gene chain, and enabling, and enabling this commerce. The joys of working from home, Mark. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got a little, little bowl of kibble here that I keep on my desk. Yeah, I'm so. just going to let my dog out and show you. <laughs> Come here. Come on. Go. 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 There we go. Okay. It could have been my child. It was my dog. But... Yeah, I know. This is this is the fun of working from home. We've all got children. We've all got dogs. And every now and then the postman or the, or the, the bin man goes past or whatever. So all good fun. That just shows we're genuine. So 70 million coins, as you say, no more being, being released. So obviously that is going to put pricing pressure on the coins because it's not in the price mode coin, which, which is wonderful. So, you know, they, these things are eventually going to be worth, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in coin and I don't know, surpass Bitcoin, who knows? Uh, one could only okay. hope. I like to think of it, you know, there's 7 billion people in the world. Yeah. Um, nearly seven, 70 million uh, DNA tokens. Um, so, you know, as this genomic economy grows and everybody um, gets to take part in it, and that's our goal, you know, mm. we want the very poorest people in the world to have access to the value of their data. Imagine the life changing um, uh, am amount of money they could earn um, simply by contributing to science. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, they could make a decent, for us, it's a gig, right? A couple yeah. hundred dollars a year. Uh, but for the very poorest people in the world, whose data is often very highly valued, mm. um, that would be life-changing money. So, so that 7 billion people should all have access to the value of their DNA. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm pretty boring. I'm pretty ordinary. So my DNA is just going to be, you know, the standard kind of European Blah, blah. You and me both, yeah. Um, so um, you, you're saying I could make a couple of hundred dollars a year just from basically renting out my DNA. But I'm imagining yeah. people in third world countries where, you know, they may have had malaria or they may have had an interest in tropical disease in their, in their genes, either themselves or their parents. Mm -hmm. They're possibly going to make more money. They could well. And, and I mean, even though $200 is a lot to many people in the world, uh, mm. uh, they could be making thousands of dollars a year based upon the value of their unique genomics. You know, the amount of genomic data in the world is tilted heavily toward folks like us, yeah. you know, like you and me. Um, and that's, that's a shame because there's a lot of important medicine um, that could be overlooked um, because of this limited pool of genomic data. We have a partner called Indigenous AI, uh, which is a Kenyan startup. Um, and they are uh, doing genomic testing uh, for research projects in Kenya. And they came to us because they want to be able to share that value uh, mm. with people in Kenya, uh, where, where you know, that's significant money as well. Um, so we think that's the future is uh, you know, building upon that trapped capital that the Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto refers to as trapped capital um, that people are sitting on without access to, and we're providing access to it. The, the average person in Kenya may not be able to afford 
you know, $99 to get their, their DNA right. sent to 23andMe or Ancestry.com. So how, right. do, how do we get around that problem? Can, so can you give them out, a loan and then they pay well, it back with the DNA profits or? Maybe, but I think um, the model we're using right now in Kenya is um, there are research projects that want to test people mm -hmm. um, and, and they're going to do it. They're going to do the science, uh, but they also think that, you know, there's going to be value for that data outside that particular research project um, and they can resell that data and share the value uh, with the subjects in those, in those trials. So indigenous AI is, is acting like a clinical research organization putting together these studies, um, making sure there's more um, African um, DNA available for science, mm -hmm. targeting specific populations who need you know, specific medical care and scientific study, um, but also making sure that money uh, comes back to them, the value of that data um, rewards them. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of um, indigenous peoples, like you know, say Native Americans, and you know, some of these guys running around in the Amazon rainforest that are very, very niche. I guess DNA, you'd probably understand it a lot better than what I would. I just think they look different, they act different, they haven't so much mixed with the the rest of the people. Um, well, here in Mexico, actually, yeah, there's there's uh, many there's there's maybe a hundred. Um, different indigenous populations mm. um, whose data is wanted. Um, but one of the big objections over time has been the fact that that's a sort of biocolonialism uh, and that you know, it, it, it echoes the HeLa cell uh, issue. Um, and you know, there's, a, there's an interest in making sure that in the future, um, these studies reward the people who are um, being subjects for those studies. Uh, and make them part of that. One of your first points was that you can't pattern the DNA, you can't. So I'm wondering like if, if some nasty company buys my DNA or buys the DNA from one of these little sort of Amazonian tribes um, using a DNA coin, what's to stop them then from reselling it to other people and other people and bypassing the DNA ecosystem? So they'll need to be. They'll need to create a database that would be aggregated and provide, um, you know, all of the metadata that makes that data valuable. And that's, you know, that's a big task, uh, too. And they won't have the the what we have, which is the individual contact with the people who are uploading their DNA and providing that data. Selling raw DNA without, uh, you know, one one sample with even if you have a little metadata is worthless. Yeah. It's all about aggregation. It's all about getting it in some sort of, you know, coherent, scientifically valid data set. Um, so that's one thing that stands in the way. It's much, it's very unlikely they would do that. I suppose somebody could try to replicate our marketplace and probably others will. Mm. Um, um, but they'll have to, again, they'll have to ha have people download their data, upload it to them, create a, the metadata. I'll make it searchable, create an economy for it, et cetera. So um, there's a lot in the way of that. I, I don't think that's a si significant risk. Yeah, I mean, there, there could be competitors, but you're saying they're starting years and years behind. It's like someone could invent a brand new Bitcoin with better coding today, but yeah. they're, they're 15 years behind the eight ball. So trying to catch up would be a, would be a big thing. We, we, we're on the ground floor with it and, and we're pretty confident that our model you know, will sustain uh, competition, even if that competition uh, becomes serious. So, as you, you've been in the in the field for a long time, your partner's been in the field for a long time, um, and you've you've seen it changing when other people weren't even aware of what's going on. We were just looking like, oh, DNA. I've I've got a Jewish ancestor from 500 years ago, or something like that, or a Viking from a thousand years ago. But you're actually watching the market grow. How how big do you think this marketplace is going to get? Well, Gartner uh, expects that it'll be a $24 billion marketplace, the whole genomics marketplace um, in two years. Um, two years. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, but that's, you know, that's all the testing and uh, other infrastructure <laughs> components of genomics as well. Um, our, our niche in it right now, um, we can estimate based upon what's going on this year with Ancestry and 23andMe. That's, I mean, that's already almost a $8 billion marketplace, just the testing and the, you know, the selling of data. 
Um, so if that's the value this year, based upon you know the the, the SPAC and the and the buyout um, that we've seen this past year, um, you know we could be a, a significant portion of that 24 billion in the next couple of years. We're all going to be rich. Awesome. I mean, well, that, we are rich. We're sitting on all this wealth. Uh, yeah. We just don't know how to properly share it. And, and True. Extract. It's like I've got a little farm inside myself, but I haven't been selling the crops. <laughs> Yep. Where someone else has been been making a profit from it. I guess that's one one of the big things. Um, investing into a new cryptocurrency, you never know how it's going to work. You never know which company is going to be profitable. And even going back to the olden days, everyone says, oh, "I wish I had have invested in Microsoft in 1977, or I wish I had have bought Apple shares in 1983." But you didn't know back then that they were going to be massively successful. So you guys have already been doing this for a long time, and you've already got a model that can actually pay me more than my investment. So if I pay that it's $140 in Aussie dollars, $99 US dollars elsewhere in the world, um, you're saying I could already make, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars or even a thousand dollars back from that already without waiting for this, you know, without waiting for a project to take off, without waiting for my investment to actually become a unicorn. It's profitable now. It, it could be, you know, obviously we can't um, promise that it would be. Some of our oh, I got good genes. I got good genes. <laughs> yeah. Some of our users have genes. made uh, enough to buy uh, a test. Um, some of our users have made nothing so far. Yeah. Right now yeah. we have about 1,500 people who have uploaded their data. Uh, that needs to come up to about 10,000 to be a really scientifically useful data set. Mm -hmm. So we recently did an STO, raised some cash. We're doing some marketing to try to get us up to that 10,000 user um, point. We have 7,000 wallets, but only 1,500 of them have uploaded their data. So we're going to try to convince those 7,000 wallet holders to get their testing and upload that data. We're doing some advertising and reaching out through our community. Um, but we're also going direct to, uh, we're doing direct advertising because actually honing in on the 50 million people have already been tested mm -hmm. um, is not that complicated thanks to Google. <laughs> selling their yeah. data yeah exactly right uh, very cool very cool i mean you could also try try the approach of saying hey here's a free dna test um you just pay us back from your profits well you know that that's a little that's a little expensive for us so, uh, you know before we go spending 99 bucks per user to, to get a user uh we're going to spend it costs about 20 dollars for us to acquire a user who uploads their data based upon our current testing. Right. So that's, that's a little cheaper. And I guess I guess you got to keep your margins low because you're operating on, on pretty um, pretty skinny margins. You're giving 90% of the money away to the, the end user. That's that's fantastic. It, it's a good deal for our users. The infrastructure isn't too complicated because we're not moving any physical product uh, mm. and we're serving as just a you know an exchange. Um, so Brilliant. I think it works out well for everybody. Okay, so you, you've already told us there's a couple of exchanges where we can actually buy DNA um, on the exchanges. So now if, if somebody wants to actually, um, I guess, sign up and submit their data, where do they go? They go to encryptgen.com um, and they create a, Encrypt an account. Gen and with so, G. Yep. Uh, yep. And, we'll put a link up in the one. Thank you. Yeah, in the in the upper right hand corner is a way to register, and, and once you do that, you get a wallet. Yeah. Um, and if you have any questions about how to upload the data, um, we have, a, as I said, on our YouTube channel, explainer videos. Um, <clears throat> it's really straightforward. Once you get that file from Twenty Three and Me, it's you just drag and drop it onto your profile, fill in some profile data as much or as little as you want, uh, and sit back and wait to start earning DNA. Fantastic. Fantastic. It sounds so simple when you explain it. I know there's a lot of medical data and a lot of technical data behind it. Um, so in, in addition to showing me on the YouTube video how to actually click and drag and, and put my DNA in there and to actually download my information from Ancestry or, or 23andMe, do you have further explainer videos on the actual nuts and bolts behind it for those people who are more technically advanced than me and want to know more? We do a bit, yeah. So on our on our YouTube channel, there's a there's actually a nice five minute corporate demo video all about our business model and um, you know the the way that our platform works, um, narrated by Rob Lowe. 
<laughs> Famous <laughs> medical scientist Rob Lowe. Yeah. Um, but and with you know all the all the bells and whistles of a nice corporate demo. Um, but there's also you know I'm on um, I do AMAs once a month mm -hmm. uh, on that channel. I've done numerous um, conferences and and many of those are recorded. Um, and I'm also very available. You can join our Telegram channel. Uh, there's a, an officially endorsed one. That's where I hang out. There's a yep. couple other ones where you can go if you want. And, uh, but if you want to talk to me, it's easy to reach out to me through that. Um, and uh, you know, I, I can always uh, answer questions. I get you know, questions every day. And we have a rising, growing uh, community um, of people who are also very eager to help um, and answer questions too, because they've been with us from the start. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. You've answered all of my questions. You've answered some other questions that sort of popped up along the way. There will be some medical students and scientists who want to ask more questions. Um, there'll be some other people who are just like, how soon can I make my money back? But <laughs> that's entirely up to your DNA, I guess, as you say. So you might make it back in six months. It might take you two years, depending on depending on the what the science. The of the marketplace, the mystery yeah. of the invisible hand. But we, if we compare that to how quickly do you make your money back from Google selling your data or Facebook selling your data or anybody else selling your data, the answer is never. So right. obviously EncryptGen, way cooler idea. So we'll have the links in the description, EncryptGen.com. Thank you, Dr. David. Thank the you. The most wonderful, most informative, and you've put up with my puppies. So and you put up with mine. So. You're all good with our books. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jerry. Cheers. Take care.